it's good seeing you here. I'm just going to give you a couple of announcements. Uh, we do have nursing home uh, this Tuesday at Heritage Hall. That service starts at 1030, so if you're able to go help out with that, that would be great. Now, it is uh, a mask. Uh, when you get into the building, they'll ask you, they'll probably take your temperature up front. Uh, they've been doing that. Have you, they'll sign your name in and everything when you get in the building. And then you, when you leave, this is the way it was last month anyway, they'll also check you out. So that way, make sure that you left the building. Uh, but they do ask you to wear a mask while you're in the building. And uh, it'll be in the cafeteria. Now, I don't think the folks there that are uh, in the nursing home are wearing masks. Um, but they just ask that people who are coming in from the outside do that. So anyway, just make a note of that. Um, and then also, don't forget about the Brotherhood Fellowship coming up October 30th. And if you uh, get your partner that you're going to have you in, get your partner you're going to have in the, uh, the little uh, cornhole tournament there, and we'll get paired up and have a good time. And then also the chili cook-off. Uh, either let Jody know uh, who your teammates want to be, and then also if you're planning on doing the chili cook-off, uh, that is also on the church Facebook page if you want to let uh, them know through that. And then Faith Promise Sunday coming up November 14th with Brother Lee. Uh, he'll be here for all three services. And then our church-wide Thanksgiving meal and service is November 24th. And uh, a little bit before that, probably a week before that, we'll be getting... Uh, we'll start our Christmas play, and it's that time of year. Uh, we'll be giving parts to the young people, so uh, young people, I hope you get ready for that. I'll try to give you the play as soon as I can, so you can be working on that and uh, working on your parts. But uh, anyway, that's that's all the announcements I have. Keep it short, sweet, simple, to the point. So let's all stand. Let's welcome one another to our service, and then we'll prepare for our Sunday night off.
sing higher ground.
obedience is very important. Let me ask you this while you're thinking of a verse. How many of you have uh, what you would call as your life verse? Anybody? Yeah, a few of you. Good. So you can say your life verse too. Anybody else? Another verse? Five words. Since you're good. <clears throat> it's a good opportunity to get God's word in our heart and uh, memorize it, think about it. And uh, I know my life verse, 1 Corinthians 9.16, it was one of the verses God used when he called me to preach. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me, but the woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. And there's been times in my life I felt like Jeremiah. I got so frustrated and fed up, said I'm keeping my mouth shut. I'm not saying another word. I'm not going to witness for the Lord. These people can just, you know, burn and they can just die. And I got so sick of the world, and, but I couldn't keep my mouth shut. And it just burned in my bones, and, and I had to keep preaching to my coworkers and, and keep on going. So <clears throat> we just need to, you know, God will give you a verse like that. If you don't have a life verse, you'd like to say, I do not have a verse just to kind of live my life by. You know, just pray about it. God will give you one in due time. Anybody else? I have my life verse. All right, great. We've got a cup here. Just receive your citizens. And be all Lord who have put my trust in me and be put to confusion. Well, that's good. 71 1. Yep. I could probably use that one right now, too. Me, too. Beth, do you have one? Yes, mine is Philippians 4 13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen. There's our next piano player. No way. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. That'd be good. Anybody else? Yeah, I don't remember the reference, but that will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on me because he trusts in me. Trust in the Lord God and the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. Amen. Yes. It's good. Anybody else? My wife first. It's James 5 8. Be doers of the words, not hearers only. Yeah. Actually, I think you're thinking of chapter 1, but that's right there in James. No, it's James. Okay. That's good. <laughs> close, close enough. <laughs> yeah, that's good. It's a good verse. Anybody else? Yep, My okay. life verse is Proverbs 1 3 For the fear of the Lord is to gain knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Yeah. Amen. Yeah, that's true. So, if you have today, I'll do this. This may be my favorite verse, or I've got several favorite verses, yeah. but this one I like. Surely the goodness and mercy to follow me in the days of my life, and I'll swell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Amen. And you know, that's the thing, too, is as Christians, we have to get used to church because this is what we're going to be doing. Uh, we're going to be worshiping, praising the Lord, having a good time. And uh, you know, it's going to be God's going to be our light there. And so we might as well get used to the things that fellowship can another and uh, being in the body of Christ because that's the way it's going to be. Anybody else? I don't want to pay anybody short. <coughs> it's not my life first because it's a little bit too sad to be a life first but uh, Ecclesiastes 1-2 is vanity of vanities. Say it the preachers, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. That's good. You know what vanity means? Yeah. That's good. Vanity is emptiness. Just nothing there. Anybody else? Yes, yeah. After this manner, pray ye. I like the same old prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, how would be thy name? Thy kingdom come. Thy
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. See, I just set the bar up a little bit higher. Man, you got sick of her. Anybody else? I was actually thinking, I don't have a, a verse memorized, but I know Galatians 2.20, but I know it to a tune, so it's not nowhere near that level. But um, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Amen. Yeah. That's a good way to memorize those verses. And you can even make up your own little tune to those things. That was actually how we did uh, we did the books of the Bible, I think, last week. We'll do it again here in just a second. But that's how we got that, getting the books of the Bible in. Just kind of pick a tune out and put the words to it. Anybody else? That's great. You guys are doing a fantastic job with that. And you know, it's good just to, a lot of times you memorize more verses than you think you do. There's verses that come to your mind. You may not remember the reference. And don't be embarrassed if you don't remember the reference. You know, uh, there's a lot of verses that I don't always remember the reference to. You know, we don't have the whole, creatures don't have the whole Bible memorized. Sometimes it's just a verse. It's like, oh yeah, that's a good verse. Like, where is that? And that's why I use Blue Letter Bible a lot of times. I'll just type in part of the verse and I'll pull up the verse. Oh, that's where it's at. And uh, sometimes you'll remember it, sometimes you won't. But those are good. Well, open your Bibles, if you would, to the table of contents. We're going to do our books of the Bible song again. <clears throat> Some of you look at me like, what? <laughs> I don't remember that book of the Bible. The table of contents. And if you remember, we did the tune last week to One Little, Two Little, Three Little Indians. And we're going to do this again. And just probably do this just every once in a while to try to learn the books of the Bible, because it's something that we all ought to remember uh, where you know, it should be easy to say, okay, this is an Old Testament book and this is a New Testament book, but we ought to be a little more specific. If we've been in church in a period of time, we need to know where these books are found, uh, the order that they're in. So you can cheat there if you want to and just uh, look at your table of contents. If you, if The way you'll get this down eventually is try to look away and see which ones you can get. And then get it that way. But we're going to start here. And I'm going to look because I'm leading. And I don't want to mess you all up if I mess up. So here we go. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms, and the Proverbs, Song of Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentation, Ezekiel, Daniel, Jose, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Bacchus, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, these are the books of the Old Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Acts, Romans, 1st and Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Hebrew, James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st and 2nd, 3rd John, Jude, and Revelation. What well, sounded a whole lot better than mine, so we guys good. You guys are doing a great job. Well, take your Bibles and turn to 1 Kings chapter 17. Where is that at? <laughs> to the New Testament, 1 Kings chapter 17. <laughs> There's one in every group, I tell you what. <laughs> First Kings 17. <clears throat> I have a little story here about Elijah. Try to give you something a little practical here tonight, something that you can use and, 
and uh, consider in your own life. And of course, always try to encourage folks to uh, you know, to read. And if you have a Bible, it's good to carry your Bible with you to church. So that way, if you take notes, some people don't write their Bible, and that's okay. Uh, but you ought to have a notebook or something you can take notes in and think. Maybe God gives you a thought, and you want to remember that thought. It's good to get in the habit of writing those things down because don't ever trust your memory. You'll never remember what it is again. So write it down so you can look back at it and reference it later. But 1 Kings chapter 17 and verse number 1 says, And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Cherith, that is before Jordan. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. So he went and did according unto the word of the Lord, for he went and dwelt by the brook Cherith, that is before Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning, and bread and flesh in the evening, and he drank of the brook. And it came to pass, after a while, that the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Now, I simply want to preach a message here about when the brook dries up. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the word of God, and, and I pray that you will help us now to apply, Lord, what it is we hear, apply it to our hearts and lives. And, and Lord, as we sang the songs earlier, and uh, sang the, the congregational hymns, sang the choir hymns, Lord, we just thank you because you are so wonderful. Mm -hmm. And uh, Lord, you are our Redeemer. And Lord, one day we are going to be with you for all eternity. And until that time comes, Lord, we know that, that we're here on this earth. We have a mission to accomplish. And that is trying to reach as many people with the gospel of Jesus Christ as we can. And Lord, we're here for just such a short time. And we can see the signs of the times all around us. We know that your coming is very, very soon. So, Lord, I pray that we might be found faithful to you, that, Lord, you might use us in ways that we just never thought possible. And, uh, Lord, we just pray that you'll receive the glory and honor for everything done in our lives. Thank you, Lord, and help us always to show our appreciation to you and how much we love you uh, because you first loved us. And, Father, we ask these things now in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, when the brook dries up, here in verse number 7, it says, And it came to pass after a while that the brook dried up, because there had been no rain in the land. <clears throat> God was teaching Elijah uh, an important lesson here in his life, and he's a prophet of God. And I think the lesson you and I can learn from this, same, this very same lesson is that Elijah's supply only can come from God. That's what God tries to teach us. Is our supply, no matter what it is, has to come from him. Elijah's supply was not from the brook. It was from God. God just happened to use the brook. One of the hardest things I think we have to do as a Christian, besides obeying the Lord and trusting the Lord, one of the other hardest things to do is to wait on the Lord. Yeah, yeah. Man. Waiting on the Lord is very difficult. Hold your place here. We'll be back here in just a second. Turn to Psalm 27. I want you to see these few verses here. Psalm 27. This is a great psalm here about waiting on the Lord. I'll give you a second to get there. And if you've never had to wait on God sometime in your life, I'm just going to tell you the time's coming. You're going to have to wait on God for an answer to prayer or wait on God for uh, some type of deliverance. And it is always best to wait. The world tries to get us to rush and to hurry and make impulse choices. And when you do that, more than likely you're going to be wrong. Uh, you should not, if you're an impulse buyer, you should get out of that habit. Uh, you should not be an impulse buyer. You ought to pray about your purchases and things. And just, you know, sometimes just let the Lord, even though you can afford it, and say, well, I can afford to get this. Just say, Lord, I would like to see you provide this for me. If you want me to have it, provide this for me. And I tell you what, you'll be amazed how God will take care of some of the, the dinkiest little things in life and also some of the greatest things in life financially. God does a lot of things to meet our needs. But Psalm 27 here, 
says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even my enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though an host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. Now, let me say this. As we're reading this psalm, you need to put yourself in David's shoes. His enemies are really wanting to consume him. They're wanting to not just kill him, but cut up his body into pieces. This is what he's facing with here. And he says, look, I'm going to be confident in God. God is my protector. He's my light. He's my salvation. This is not something David is just kind of reading on a, uh, just a casual day in his life. He's going through some serious things in his life. He needs some direction from the Lord in what to do. Verse 4 says, One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. You see, David had his priorities in order. Verse number 5, For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me up upon a rock. And now shall my head be lifted up above mine enemies round about me. Therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing, yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Have mercy also upon me and answer me. When thou sayest, seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, Thy face, Lord, will I see. Hide not thy face far from me. Put not thy servant away in anger. Thou hast been my help. Leave me not, neither forsake me, O God of my salvation. When my, ma my, when my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. Teach me thy way, O Lord, and lead me in the plain path because of mine enemies. Deliver me not over unto the will of mine enemies, for false witnesses are risen up against me. And such as breathe out cruelty. I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. And he shall strengthen thy heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. One of the hardest things to do in life is simply to wait on God. Back in our story there in 1 Kings 17, God had told Elijah, <clears throat> gave Elijah the command that, he was to keep it from raining. So Elijah prophesied and it was not to rain for years. We don't know how many years at this time, but it did not rain for several years until he had given the word again. And then God gives him a command to go by a certain brook, the brook by the name of Cherith. And he said, look, I want you to go by this brook, and that's where you're going to stay because I'm going to make sure that you have your needs met. You're going to have the water you need to drink. The ravens are going to come and they're going to bring your food for you. And that's going, to, that's going to happen for a while. Now, Elijah didn't know how long this was going to go on. But as Elijah's sitting there, something he's eventually starting to notice. And that's as the, the water brook is trickling down the downstream there. It's getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And he's seeing the brook dry up. Now, I wonder what you and I would do in that same situation. Well, I'll tell you what we probably would do. One of the first things we probably would do is we would gently complain to the Lord. Uh, Lord, do you notice this brook's getting smaller and smaller? Uh, Lord, uh, it's getting harder to get a drink of water. And then, when the brook eventually dries up, Lord, do you not care about my soul? Do you not care about me? Isn't that what we do? We complain. Something else we'd probably do <clears throat> is we would get ahead of God. Mm -hmm. If you look back at verse number one, it says, There shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. This is what Elijah, Elijah had told Ahab. <clears throat> What we would do is get ahead of, ahead of God and say, well, if it's going to be according to my word, all right, cause it to rain to fill this brook up again. He could have done that. You have to remember this brook dried up, not a drop of water anywhere. It wasn't just down to a small stream now. This is completely dried up. And he's still being obedient to the Lord, waiting on the Lord. 
He might have also started second guessing himself. We do that too, don't we? We start second guessing now. Did God really tell me to do that? Did I really hear that from the Lord? Or was that just me that told me to do that? I've been there before. I remember God led me to a job down in Tennessee. I was working at a plant. And one week, and I was confident that was where God led me. The first week on that job, we, I worked seven 12-hour shifts. And I found out this was going to be a normal thing. Every week. And I thought, man, this isn't what I signed up for. Lord, are you sure this is where you led me? My other job that I left, they kept begging me to come back. As a matter of fact, they called, they called me twice, wanted me to come back to work, and they were wanting to hire me on full time, give me a raise, and this and that. Still wasn't equal to what I was going to make there, but I, t I told the guy, my boss at that other job was a Christian, and I said, you know, as much as I would love to work here, I can. God led me to this other place. But in my heart, I'm starting to wonder, it's like, Lord, this isn't what I thought. When I signed up for this job, this is what, what I thought it was going to be. And then God basically just told me to be quiet. Quit complaining and wait on him. And it took some time for me to see what God's purpose was in all of that. But sometimes we second guess ourselves. Sometimes We've done this. I've done this too. You've probably done this. We take matters into our own hands, don't we? So, okay, well, the brook's dried up here. I know God's promised to meet all my needs, so there's a brook somewhere else he wants me to go to. I really feel that's what God's will is for my life, and then up we go to someplace else, and that's not what God told us to do, but we just took matters into our own hands. And then we end up messing everything up. And thankfully... God can make those crooked places straight again. Yeah. He can fix our messes. Sometimes the messes end up scarring our life. He can't, he can't fix the scars, but he can heal the wounds. Thank God for that. But there's all kinds of drying brooks in our life. So what do we do when the brook dries up? There's drying brooks of sometimes just being liked. You know, we want people to like us, and people aren't liking us anymore. Seems like our enemies are mounting around us, and even people who once we would consider a very close friend sometimes may seem to be stabbing us in the back. Sometimes that brook can dry up. Sometimes it's our health. We have the drying brooks of health. We take it for granted until our health starts to go away, and then we're like, oh, maybe I should have done something different. Sometimes it's the drying brooks of our employment or our finances. We get secure in a job and we think it's always going to be there and then one day it's not. They can dry up in a hurry. Sometimes it's the drying brooks of just relationships. And I'm going to tell you, if you take your spouse for granted, that brook's going to dry up. You should never take your spouse for granted. You should never take your children for granted. Children, you should never take your parents for granted. Because one day may come, they're not going to be there. We have all kinds of drying brooks that are possible in our life. So what we do when we're faced with these drying brooks, what, are we, what does God want us to do? How does he want us to respond? How can we wait on the Lord? But well, we need to realize God uses these drying brooks in our life to teach us some things. So what is it God tries to teach us through drying brooks? One thing is, the first thing he wants, I think, to teach us is we must learn to take one step at a time. Now, some of us are ambitious people. Some of us are always looking for a new challenge. I'm that way. I've always been that way. I like challenges, and I like looking for a new challenge. And, and I tend, uh, if I tend to not be challenged by something, then you know, I get stuck in a rut in a hurry, and I like looking for a new challenge. And sometimes we're that way in life. But God doesn't want us to be ambitious all the time. He wants us to learn to take one step at a time and to walk with him along the way. Psalm 37, 23 says, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Now, you can take that last part of that verse <laughs> two different ways. And he delighteth in his way, or he delighteth in his way. 
But the steps of the good man are ordered by the Lord. And as God directs your steps, he will also direct your journey in the process. But you take it one step at a time. C.A. sang part of the uh, what we call the Lord's Prayer, the model prayer there. Part of that prayer says, give us this day our what? Daily, Daily bread. But you know the way we live our life sometimes, we say, give us what we need for the next 20 years until I retire. Or give us what we need to make it through retirement. But the prayer says, give us this day our daily bread. You know what that's saying? We need to learn to walk with God. And sometimes we see the brook drying up, but we take it one day at a time. One step at a time. That's the way God wants us to handle these things. His word also tells us, says, thy word is a lamp unto my feet. A light unto my path. I mentioned this verse before, as you're walking and trying to find God's will in your life, you might see the journey, see what, okay, this is where I think God wants me to go, way out in front, but the only way you're going to get there is take it one step at a time. And as you take that step, God shows you the next step. And then when you obey that step, he shows you the next step. And then you obey that step. You keep on doing it one step at a time. Next thing you know, you aren't anywhere close to that. But God used that little glimpse to get you started on that journey one step at a time. And you'll find as you keep obeying the Lord, and as he keeps directing your steps, you're eventually going to be where he wants you to be. I'm going to tell you and be dead honest with you, back when I was 18 years old, where I thought I was going to be at this time in my life is not in Casimir Baptist Church. <laughs> I thought I was going to be in Paris, France. I thought by the time I was 25, I was going to have my first million, be driving my white Rolls Royce with gold trim fenders, going down Park Avenue in New York City. That's what I thought. And God gave me that glimpse way off in the future. And here I was even out of the will of God. But God gave me that little glimpse to get me to take one step. And then I got a little dissatisfied with that step, so I looked around. Oh, there's another step. I'll take that step. That looks good. And God even used those things in my disobedience to get me to where he wanted me to be. Matter of fact, I had a secure job uh, working for the Naval Air Warfare Center in uh, Patuxent River, Maryland. And I was an electrical engineer trainee, had everything set, had a guaranteed job after graduation from high school. And that or after high school, after college, and I was miserable, miserable. And that's what I wanted to do ever since I was in sixth grade was be an electrical engineer. And I was miserable. And I thought, you know, I just want to do something to help people. I was so far out of God's will, couldn't see anything in life. I just want to do something to help people. I know what I'll do. I'll become a doctor. One semester. I was supposed to go to work that summer. I changed my major to become a pre-med major. Took a biology class at the West Virginia University of Parkersburg. And while I was in that biology class, I had to get a job to help pay bills. I worked at Ponderosa Steakhouse. And then guess who God brought to Ponderosa Steakhouse? Brought a 16-year-old boy first who talked to me and witnessed to me from time to time. And then while I was talking to him one time, in comes this sweet-looking young girl. I said, wow, who's that? Well, that's my sister. Yeah, right. You wish. No, it really is. Still didn't believe me. I had to check her last name, but it was a sister. I thought, man, I'm 21 years old. This 16 year is going to be my best friend. <laughs> Got to know him. But you know what happened? God took every one of those steps in my life where I'm just looking. I'm not in the will of God. I'm taking whatever step I can see. And here I saw this glimpse of where I thought I would be. And it ended up taking me off on another journey somewhere else. God actually used that situation to get me into church. He used that situation to break my heart and get me to surrender my life to him again. He used that situation for me to yield to the call of the ministry. He used that situation to change everything in my life. And sometimes, when, and I'll be honest with you, in my life, it looked like the brook was drying up. I thought, what in the world is going on? 
I've always wanted to be an electrical engineer. I always had this plan for my life, and now nothing is going right. I never had to study in school. Everything always came easy to me in school, and then all of a sudden, I'm starting to struggle in school. Things, I mean, things just aren't coming like they used to. It's like, what is going on here? I mean, math was no longer easy. Science was no longer easy. And I thought, man, something is going on. God is getting my attention by allowing the brook to dry up. And then, even as I started my journey in the Christian life, I had already been saved, got my salvation settled, found out I was saved as a young boy. And as I started my journey in the Christian life, God was teaching me some other valuable lessons about learning to wait. You see, we get anxious, we get in a hurry. And one of the hardest lessons for us to do when we see the brooks around us drying up and things start falling apart, we want to take matters into our own hands. We want to complain about it. We want to do all these things. What did Elijah do? He just sat by the brook. I wish I had his confidence. Something else we need to do whenever we see the brooks drying up is we must learn to trust God completely. Learn to trust Him completely. That should be a, a no-brainer, but it's something we have to be reminded of. And when we trust God completely, this includes His timing. His timing's perfect. I told you the story how Becky and I, we were, uh, we had been married for a few years and we had a few kids and uh, we needed a man. And I was actually on a youth activity down in Florida and had some teenagers with me. And she found this van. It was a pretty good price. And, and uh, it was out of our price range still. And, and, but we needed one. And I thought, well, you know, I've got a couple credit cards. I can put some money on it and we can get, work it out somehow, some way. But I had already learned by this time, and she had as well, that we just need to pray about it. And even though it looked like it was a deal that couldn't be passed up, just pray about it. If God wants us to have it, it'll be there three days from now. Why get in a hurry? God can keep it. Well, it wasn't three days. It was more like a week or two. The next week, the price dropped more. It's like, man, this is a deal, but we still don't have the money. It's like, Lord, we sure would like this van, but it's just out of our price range. We still can't afford to have it. Would you help the price come down just a little bit more? Another week goes by, price comes down to where we can actually afford it. We went over there, talked to the guy, he was from Belfry, Ohio, and uh, we went to go see it. It was a great van, beautiful van. And I don't know why it didn't sell. Matter of fact, the guy told us, he goes, man, I have no idea why this did not sell. He goes, normally I'd put this up for sale and I'd get a call, I'd have it sold the same day. He goes, but for whatever reason, this was here for a few weeks. I said, yeah, we know. We watched the price come down a, few, a little bit, and now it's in our price range. We drove it. And it's like, hmm, yeah, we were pretty impressed. This is what God has for us. And, and uh, I didn't try to wheel and deal with the guy. I just said, well, is this, are you pretty firm on the price? He says, well, I would like to get rid of it. And I said, I'm just going to be honest with you. God saved this vehicle. That's why he didn't sell it. He saved this vehicle for us. God taught us to simply wait on the Lord. And wait for his timing. His timing is perfect and everything. You know, when the children of Israel were walking through the wilderness, they needed some food. Can you imagine trying to provide enough food for over a million people every single day? God did. Provided manna every single day. Six days out of the week. They would go out and collect manna, little wafers that looked like some coriander things that grew on the ground. They would pick it up, and they would go home. They could make their, their bread, bread from heaven. On the sixth day, they had to gather twice as much because on the seventh day, there wasn't going to be any manna. Some people didn't believe it, so they didn't, they didn't gather it up. They thought it was going to be there the seventh day. Well, those people didn't have anything to eat that seventh day. Some people gathered too much, and what was left over was rotted from the next day. But on that sixth day, it didn't rot. You see, God worked all those things out. Because his timing is perfect, we have to learn to trust God in everything. I'm, and sometimes I think, and when we did the Bible memory verses, some of you have quoted Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not on thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths, even when the brooks are drying up. 
We must also learn the value of what we would call the hidden life. I wonder how your hidden life is. What is the hidden life? The hidden life is your Christian life, your Christian walk you have with God when nobody else is around. Not your children, not your spouse. Nobody else is around. That's your hidden life. And I'm telling you what, you find out in a hurry what your hidden life's made of when that brook starts drying up. Yeah. It's important to have a hidden life, a secret life of God where you can spend time in, with him intimately in prayer, in his word, get to know him, and pour your heart out to him, pour your complaints out to him. David did that many times in the psalm. But he learned the value of the hidden life. Moses learned the value of the hidden life when he was on the backside of the desert for 40 years. John learned the value of the hidden life while he was on the Isle of Patmos. And, and guess what he did? He wrote the book of Revelation. John the Baptist learned the value of the hidden life when he was in the wilderness. And Jesus himself learned the value of the hidden life when he spent many uh, much time alone up on a mountain apart so he could spend time with the Father. The hidden life's important. When we see the brooks drying up, we must also learn to obey and be led by the Spirit of God. I mentioned that a little bit this morning about obedience. <coughs> Elijah, here in this story, after uh, he had waited by the brook, I want you to notice here, let's look at verse 8. Look at what God did to him. It says, And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Now this is after the brook dried up, completely dried up. And then God gives him a word. God didn't give him any word until the brook dried up. Then the word of God came to him and said, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. God already knew what was going to happen. Already knew where he was going to go. But he waited until the brook dried up and then gave him a word. And said, I want you to go to Zarephath. Moses was sent back to Egypt. At the command of God, when he saw the Lord speaking to him out of the burning bush, Jonah was sent to Nineveh. He didn't want to go. Ran from God. But he ended up going. And God sent a great revival through Jonah, a rebellious prophet. Peter was sent to Cornelius, a wicked, uh, ungodly Gentile, an unclean Gentile, and sent to that man, and his whole household got saved. Philip was sent to the Ethiopian eunuch, who was just happened to be reading out of Isaiah one day. And the Spirit of God said, hey, you need to go next to that chariot. We need to learn to obey the Spirit of God. And when things in our life seem, the brooks seem to be drying up and things seem to be falling apart, just listen to the still, small voice of God and learn to wait on Him. He'll give you some direction. He'll tell you what you need to do. And lastly, another lesson that we can learn when the brook seems to be drying up, and this is an important one. You need to learn that God never changes. Yep. Amen. That's important. God never changes. The brook dried up for Elijah. God was still there. Yep. And if God took care of Elijah, and we learn this in Sunday school, he's no respecter of persons. He'll take care of you too. He has a Zarephath waiting for you if you will simply wait for him. He still supplies every need. My God shall supply all your need according to what? His riches and glory. Aren't you thankful it's not according to your riches, but according to his riches? He still answers prayer. He still gives victory over sin and our enemies. God never changes. We need to realize there, when the brook in our life seems to be drying up, whether it's our health, our finances, uh, our relationships, whatever it might be. God has some lessons he's trying to teach us. And we just simply need to wait on him. Be patient. <clears throat> and if your heart is frail and it's weak and your faith seems small, God will strengthen your heart in due time. You just keep depending on him. Let's all stand and have a word prayer. Father, we thank you so much for your blessings. We thank you for the precious word of God and we thank you, Lord, that, that you have promised and you never fail a promise. But you have promised never to leave us nor forsake us. And Lord, I pray that there be one here going through a difficult time right now. 
Lord, it could be something in their family. It could be something in maybe their work relationship. It could be their finances. It could be their own health. It could be some great trial, Lord, that only they know about and you know about. But Lord, I pray as they are sitting there watching the brook dry up, that, Lord, they might be encouraged because there's some valuable lessons they can learn during this time. And they need to simply do what Elijah did, just simply wait for you. Don't complain. Don't get ahead of you. Don't uh, take matters into their own hands. Don't do anything like that, but simply wait on you, Lord. And, Lord, I pray that they realize there is a Zarephath waiting for them. There's a widow woman there waiting for them to sustain them there because that's what you have for them. Father, I just pray that you will help us to completely and totally trust you with every area of our life. There's so many things we just don't understand. And Lord, so often we, because we're in our flesh, if we're honest with ourselves, sometimes we wonder if you care. But Lord, we know you do. And Lord, we thank you for we don't deserve your love. We don't deserve your goodness. But Lord, I pray that you might strengthen us and you might continue to sustain us, Lord, when we're by those brooks that are drying up. Father, we ask these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. 388. 388. We're going to sing a few verses here of a song of invitation. God spoke to your heart. Won't you come? Won't you do business with the Lord as we sing? Have I own way, Lord? Let's dismiss here in a word prayer and ask Harry if he wouldn't mind dismissing her.